Uh, speaking of kids, you can make your way to Children's Church right now, right over here. And um, we appreciate that, kids uh, in the uh, junior church. Um, this is a fascinating passage. You, you have to look at it, Joshua 14. It's about Caleb. Caleb's the man. Got, he has a lavenous personality. He's got um, this, thank you. You caught that. You caught it that quick? I thought it would take a while. Okay, he did. He had this uh, personality that was really remarkable. Um, Caleb was the one who, when they were going to take uh, the promised land, they send the 12 in, right? 10 said, well, we're not going in there. Very non lavenous And then the two, Joshua and Caleb, they were like, oh, no, we can take this. We can do it. The 10 go, no, we can't. And God wasn't happy with that and says, okay, why don't you guys stay in the desert for a while? It was 40 years. Haphazardly? No, until everybody that generation was gone, except for, right, Caleb and Joshua. So these two were, they're exceptional. They're something, they're, they're a cut above. Obviously, Joshua took over after Moses. That's, that's how exceptional he was. Caleb, Caleb's unique. And I'll just tell you flat out what he did. We have the beginning part of the book of Joshua in preparation and then taking the land. That's the first half of the book, 1 to 12. The last half our distribution of the land and blessings and inheritance. So it's kind of a, a picture, actually, of our own Christian life. We leave Egypt, which is we're saved and we've left our sinful nature behind, captivity behind. And then it's preparation and battles and blessing. We have it all mixed. I wish it could just be done. Like, wouldn't it be nice if all our battles are finished by age 40? That would be awesome. We would just be sitting back laughing at anyone under 40 that are still suffering. But it's all mixed, and we have all this mix. It's battles. It's constantly being prepared and battles and blessings. We're now crossing over into the blessings. Battles are mostly done. And Caleb, well, they just distributing all the land. They did it by lots. That's how, that's how they did that because it gave God the control of nobody has the control. It's God choosing the lots and land is distributed and we're all good. And then Caleb. Hey, one more thing. Like what? 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 You, what? Goes to Joshua and says, do you remember? And he's referring over 40 years earlier he was promised a particular area of land. And it's like Joshua's like, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we were both the spies. We were both young then. We're talking to Moses. Yeah, that's the one. Do you, don't you remember what he said? Yeah, he did promise you that land. I'll take it. This is, this is an incredible, this will mess up your theology. He is now 85 years old. They're distributing the land, and he, for his tribe, tribe of Judah, they're getting a great piece of land. There's nothing wrong with what they're, and it's all being divided up, and it's all good. And Caleb goes, you know, there is some more land there that you promised me. I'll take it. What it begs the question is, would he have gotten it if he hadn't asked? Well, that's interesting. Because if you look at the distribution of land that takes place from 14 till the end of the book, it's the last half of the book, it is tribe, 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 tribe. There's only four brief instances when there's individuals involved. And this is a big one. Because that was promised to me. He's 85 years old. I mean, this guy should be like coasting, relaxing. I mean, it's literally over, and he's not. He left nothing on the table. He's like, oh, I'll take, I'll take that land. So, 
this has amazing consequence in your personal life, in your family. Do we have less blessing because we don't ask? Or do we stick with this, not or, yeah, or, do we stick with this which has elements of truth that when we pray, we're changing ourselves, we're not changing God. When we pray, we're conforming ourselves to His will. He's sovereign, He's unchanging, so it won't affect what He gives us. Well, I'll disagree with that. If God were merely a machine, like a, a Star Wars force idea, which was intended in the movie to portray a God, gods of force, good and evil. The, one of the many problems with that model is it's not personal. Our God is personal. It's relationship. So when we reduce down to sovereignty without personality, we're sinners, and I pray to Him endlessly, and in, in so doing, I'm conforming myself to Him and His will, and He does as He pleases. Yeah, all true, all true. Deep theology there. Is it not also that He's a loving Father who blesses us and cares for us? This is an odd section with Caleb saying, okay, what about that? Do you remember that promise? I'll take it. And it was given to him exactly as it was promised, prompted by his asking. What would you ask for? If we took the lid off, what would you ask for? I'll cut to the chase. The, the, the end of, the end of the, all the notes are those wonderful passages that tell us you have not because you ask not. I don't know how you can theologically play with that and not come out with you have not because you ask not. That's Jesus. That's James. If we ask anything, according to his will, he answers us. And we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, interesting. Do we limit our blessings because we're just not even asking? Now, I'm not going into prosperity theology. You're going to ask for that jet? We're not big enough that I can ask for a ministry jet. I could ask for a ministry new motorcycle for the Lord because i got to get around to conferences and meet people really fast. Now, I'm not talking prosperity. I'm talking about, literally, what are we asking God for? What are you currently asking God for? And you say, well, but there's conditions and there. No, we have this struggle with the theology side of it because you're saying, because I just would love a new car. Well, we're not talking, and we keep throwing in the conditions. You have to keep going back to father-child parent-child relationship and the parent that says, buddy, you little buddy, you, I'd do anything for you. Literally, a parent will say that. And the kid goes, oh, that's great. Can I have like a, a Porsche? No, you cutie. Like it's not, of course he's not going to do something that's unhealthy for you. Of course he's not just a magic genie, but he doesn't say, I'll do anything for you. If it falls within my sovereign will as a father, the kid goes, you're nuts, Dad. Like, what does that mean? No, there's no conditions to this. It's a father-child. We're father-child, and we ask him. God has never been offended by words that you say to him. I remember when the kids were all, and I don't know if they all went through this. Emma went through it. She always goes through it. She's still going through it. Where, remember when the kids would say something, they're getting mad at you, and they say, I hate you, Dad. It's so cute when they say that. I mean, am I offended? Am I threatened by that? Not really. 
I remember when Grant, I, I never forget the, the nicest kid of the bunch, soft hearted. I said something, I'm not kidding, is this big? He put his finger up at me, and I'm like, okay, already, this is so funny. And he says, I don't like your no nonsense attitude. And I went, <clears throat> okay, can I have a minute? And I'm just like, that was the funniest thing. I think of that all the time with that poor little kid. Am I offended by that? Am I like, don't you dare? Why do we do that with God? Don't you dare say that to him. What, did he not just hear that exchange? <laughs> That's it. That's much better. Hide it from him. He's not threatened by us. It's a loving relationship between father and child. Say it. Oh, I wish I had a new car. <clears throat> you say, well, he won't do that. Well, no, maybe your car is in horrible condition. You actually need it. And so you're like, just ask. Can be no. But I wonder, does, do we receive more blessing when we ask? Caleb is a prime example. He, it didn't appear as though he would have received that part of the inheritance, except that he reminded, do you know you promised me that? In your notes, the first one is God is good. And I literally put these, uh, these slides together myself. And I finished them, right, Casey? And I said, I literally have made slides look like they're from 1980. Like, how can I be so out of date? But I am, so I don't even like to look at it. That is so horrible. Like, what was I? I don't know what that is. See, the, God is very, very good, and we need to start there because he has been so good to you and to me. The blessings are endless. I mean, just to look around, we're seated. I don't know if you read anything off the app, uh, the Christian Post. Christian Post is a Christian news. And there's always posts on nations today, uh, just uh, a new one. A Christian girl killed foreign country because she led a Muslim to Christ. They have no problem with that. And look at us. This is unbelievable. Like, we get to get together on Wednesday night, 6.30, 8.30. We get to. This is, like, so fun. He has blessed you and your family with so much. In the Old Testament, a lot of it was physical blessing. It was kingdom, literal kingdom and land. Internal things, too. Contentment and peace. But that same mentality went into the New Testament because they thought, oh, now we have the Messiah, and so we get another kingdom under the Messiah. They're still thinking physical. They found out it wasn't physical, the kingdom that he was bringing. He did say that. He said, the kingdom of God is within you. But he does bless us with physical things because he's amazing. But he blesses us. He's promised us things like peace, contentment. Peace I give to you, not as the world gives. And you're living without peace. Claim the promise. Say it to him. Read it to him and say it to him. There's over 600 promises in the New Testament for the believer. That sounds crazy, doesn't it? 600 not only do we not ask them, we don't know them. Because we sit back and, yeah, he'll bless me if he wants to. He knows I'm suffering. He knows all things. Ask. So, so loving and kind. He's so loving and kind that he sent Jesus Christ as a sacrifice, died in your place that belief and trust in Him alone, you have a relationship with God. Is that the best? And ever since then, we have men and women that faith in Christ that are living in a jail cell and have more contentment than many people that are living in a huge house. How, how does that? It's relationship with God through faith in Jesus. 
It's remarkable what all we have. And yet there's more. So take a look. It's the second point. There's more. In your Bible, it's Joshua 14. Is where we kind of get introduced to the Lavinus Caleb. The land is over, like generally distributed in verses four, 1 through 5, just kind of the process and what's going on in 14. And then it's 6 to the end is the section where he asks for more. Then the people of Judah in verse 6 came to Joshua at Gilgal. That was kind of the headquarters temporarily. It's where the Ark of the Covenant was. And Caleb, the son of some guy with this big name, the Kenizzite said to him, you know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God in Kadesh Barnea concerning you and me. So they made this official movement in and said, you know what he said to me. I have a feeling Joshua knew very well what was coming. I think he knew. Like, oh yeah, I, I'm well aware of that. But we're kind of in the process of distributing land to the tribes. It's kind of a big thing right now to handle this person. Okay, go ahead. He goes, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought him word again as it was in my heart, but my brothers who went up with me made the heart of the people melt. Yet I wholly followed the Lord my God, and Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land in which your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance for you and your children forever. I mean, it was almost like an emotional you went in, spied, came out. Everyone said no. You said yes, but I'm going to tell you, the land that you stepped on, it's yours. Part of it was anger to the ten. Part of it was just this, I'm, I cannot believe these ten, after everything God has done for us, that they're going to actually say we can't do it. Well, you are going to be blessed. It's all yours. This is remarkable. He was actually given it. At 85 years old, this guy says, I want more. I appreciate the distribution, and it's all been fair, but I want this extra. Again, in James 4, you have not because you ask not. 1 John 5, well, Jesus it's in the King James in my mind. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. He said it. Conditions? Don't, don't with the conditions. It's father, it's father, child. So what are you settling for right now? What have you thought, you know what, it's just the way it's going to be? I know gee, I'm going to see him someday. Thank you, Jesus, someday. I'm just going to suffer now until I get there. What is it that it's suffering? What is it that you're settling? That you just need to start asking for? Because he loves you. Say it. To, why are we suffering over on the side? And I don't want to be ungrateful. God, thank you for Jesus and thank you for... That, was, that Caleb could have said that. Hey, I don't want to be ungrateful. No, do you remember you promised me that? I'll take it. Contentment in our life. Peace in our life. John 14 says, I'm leaving you with a gift. It's peace. The peace I give, the world doesn't understand. Are you living in turmoil today? If you're living in turmoil in your heart, you don't have to. You've settled. Ask. Second Thessalonians, the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. You worried about your kids, your grandkids, a sibling? Well, there it is. He will guard you against the evil one. Say it. Ask for it. 
Philippians 4, my God will fully supply your every need according to his glorious riches. It could be cute what you think a need is. Say it. It's like if you're, um, we had a basketball hoop. And, uh, and oddly enough, the one that always just beat us in every game of horse was Grant. That made no sense to us at all. Although there'll be a couple of times he'll shoot and miss, and I'll say, nice shot. He goes, I knew it. No, it wasn't. You missed. Okay, when I'm done cleaning the court with him, and we're laughing, and we're just having fun and goofing around, and Emma says, I think it's ice cream time. And we all go, yeah, great, let's go. And we jump in the car, we we'll go to McDonald's, which is right around the corner, we'll get an ice cream cone or something. Would she and they and we had an ice cream cone except that she asked? I'm actually saying no. It wasn't on my mind. It's because she asked. Are there blessings from God because we just simply ask for it? We've got to keep going, and that's where many of us struggle. We're so theologically minded that we want to explain it in categories, but you've got to keep going to the other side and saying, it's father-child, 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 father-child. It's loving father. Describe God, the best word if you ever choose one, it's love, because it says it plainly. God is love. He supports love. He's about love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he is love. He is a loving heavenly father. Just ask. But we have to point out one thing in the passage, and it's fair. It's fair to note. I circled it in my Bible, and it's in verse 8. It says, but my brothers who went up from me made the heart of the people melt, yet I, this is what I circled, holy, I just circled the one word, holy or completely followed the Lord my God. The end of verse 9. This was the response from Moses. Surely the land in which your foot is trodden should be the inheritance for you and your children for because you have wholly followed the Lord. Wholly. Completely. The end of 14. He wholly followed the Lord, the God of Israel. I don't want you to look at it as an exception. It's not an exception. It's not like a catch. If I'm in an unhealthy relationship with my child, they are disobedient, they are disrespectful to other family members, we're going to deal with that first. Come out with that attitude. Dad, give me ice cream. No, how about if you sit down a second? We got to talk. Not because I'm a jerk, and not that I'm like I want to be punitive, but I want to free the child from being in an unhealthy relationship with me and the family because it's eating them up. I'm doing it for them. We have to deal with that first. Jesus said the same thing. When you've got a gift, you take it to the altar, and you got an issue with a brother, go take care of that first. Like, I don't want your gift. Don't do that yet. You need to be walk with me. Walk with me. Be wholly committed to the Lord. Not holy H-O-L-Y like you're like perfectly holy. No, I'm just fully committed to the Lord. Be fully committed to the Lord. And based on that, he was able to ask, and it was granted to him. Being wholly committed to the Lord. What How would someone describe you? If they literally, they said that, they're wholly committed to the Lord. Well, let's ask this. What would be the signs of it? 
What would be the traits of a person that is wholly committed, completely committed to the Lord? What would those traits be? Well, New Testament, I'm thinking of Acts 2, that the New Testament church were committed to fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayer. Uh, Yeah, in fact, you show me somebody who's a believer, faith in Christ, and they are not in fellowship in a local body. I'm just a pastor speaking, and I'm just talking case study. That's somebody who is, who has got struggles and issues in their life. Something's going on because something's wrong. A wholly committed to the Lord person is involved in fellowship. The general principle. They're not, something's going on. And the issue's not anything except their relationship with God. They're going to have to, they can ask anything they want of the Lord, but he's got some things he wants to deal with first. Well, let's talk that through first. Because it's quite remarkable that God honors character. We know that. I don't know, um, 85, 95-year-old person, Many have kind of pulled over and parked in life. I don't blame them. They're tired. Caleb's not that. Caleb was like, no, 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 no. In fact, he even bragged for a little bit. He goes, I'm as active as I've ever been. I want that land. We're limited by our own minds. I think that's true as a church. I think that's true as a family. I think it's true in our relationship with God. The reason why we as a congregation don't do more in the community in the world, it has nothing to do with money, resource, or ideas. It's the vision in our own minds of what we want to do. And we say to God, we want to do this. And we can do it. So we used to always take um, a kid. Our kids have been to every conference I've spoken, right? Sometimes I'll take one of them. If it's not the whole family, uh, I'll t- always take one with me. So they've gone to conferences with me, or they'll go to weddings and funerals. Emma loved the weddings. She'd all get she'd little, she'd all dressed up, and we'd do a wedding somewhere. And I had a denominational meeting in Flagstaff, Arizona, and I knew it was going to be... Um, not the greatest of, um, of meetings. Um, like whatever the opposite of lavenous is, that's what those people were. So I said to Ross, and he was uh, 10 years old, maybe 11, and I said, hey, buddy, how about uh, you go with me to Flagstaff? He's like, yeah, what are we doing? Mm, it's a couple hour conference. And he's just kind of staring. I said, but we're going to eat good up there. We're going to eat, and we're going to have some fun. And he's like, okay, I'll go. We go to this conference, and it was as bad as I thought it would be. And I'll never forget. We're sitting there, and it's a small group, so we couldn't, like, make fun. It was too obvious. So he's just sitting there, and he's minding his own. Partway through, he leans over, and I lean down. He said, you owe me more than lunch. And he looked back, and he had this grin on his face. Now we're giggling like, uh, like schoolgirls. I'm laughing. I'm like, that is so funny. And he's not. And we had a break, and I hit him. I'm like, you're so... He goes, Dad, this is a horrible event. You're going to take me and get me some stuff. And I'm like, what do you want? He goes, I want a new pocket knife. And I went, oh, yeah, I'll get you a pocket knife. And so we laughed. We finished the conference. And we went into a store, and he did. He ended up with a couple pocket knives, and we did some shopping and ate. We still laugh about that. I wouldn't have done it except that he asked. Just, I I mean, I wouldn't think, I wasn't thinking about that. It's whatever you want. He knew he he had, like, a blank check sitting in front of him. I mean, he manipulated that blank check. I wonder what we're leaving on the table as a family. It's not the new car. It's ask for it. I'm not saying don't. 
saying, walk with the Lord wholeheartedly. And then say it. God, I'm in turmoil because of an event in my life from a long time ago, and I'm done with it. I don't want to be that way anymore. Lead me out of this. I've settled to be sad about this, or I've settled in that broken relationship, or I've settled and I think I'm on a plan B in my life, and say, no, God, I don't want to be plan B. Those were horrible things. I'm plan A with you. I want to be top of my game with you. I want to serve you, and I want to be wide open. Would you? And he's like smiling, going, yeah, you keep going. Keep talking. Keep talking. Maybe not now. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, he could, Ross could have. We went to a sporting goods store. He could have picked up a gun and said, this one. And I said, well, that's not a knife. No, he'd laugh and he'd go back to the pocket knives. It doesn't mean that I'm going to give him everything, but the point, I just can't say it enough. Are we limiting the blessings from God because we're not asking? Stop with the exceptions. Yes, but only if I ask according to his will. I I know. I know what his will is. His will is to love you. That I do know. I don't know about the other stuff, but we ask. So first is if you don't have a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, you'll start there. Greatest blessing, if that's all he ever did for us, relationship with him through faith in Jesus Christ. Secondly, are you asking? Don't be embarrassed. Just write it down. Start a prayer list. I'm asking for these things. Let it work between the two of you. Let it change and move, or maybe he just does it. Maybe he takes it off of your heart. That's, but it's between the two of you. Just say it. And I think it's also that we're Caleb as a church. Why don't we do more as a church? I think because we've not asked. You and I want to be so far out on the limb for God that if he took his hand off, we would fall. But too often, we're close to the trunk. We're living by faith. He takes his hand off and nothing changes because we're fine. Let's be out further. Let's trust him for some great things. And obviously, it's all to the glory of himself. Let's pray. Father, it is to your glory and praise that we live wholly committed to you. Thank you that we can live wholly committed to you. And Father, help us to dream and think and ask. In Jesus' name, amen.